So I'm going to talk about animal models and preclinical imaging modalities. Um, and a, a warning, I'm going to be focusing mostly on pet neuroimaging and rhesus macaques. Um, as Vesna mentioned, Brad Christian was to have spoken this morning, but he has a serious family medical issue and asked me to come in his place. So you get me, I'm that good looking guy on top. And uh, an outline for the talk. I'm sorry, I have a little bit, are you okay to hear me in the back? But I'm also not, uh, <laughs> okay. Um, so for the outline of the talk, I'm gonna talk about animal models for neuroimaging. We'll explore that for a few minutes. And then I'll give a brief review of some in imaging methods for looking at whole brain non-invasively in animal models. And then I will come closer to shore where I feel more comfortable and talk about PET. And uh, then give some examples of PET imaging in animal models, again, mostly in rhesus. And finally, leave you with some cogent and well thought out conclusions. So to begin with, um, animal models for neuroimaging. And since we have a, a small enough crowd, if you have any trouble hearing me, or if I mumble, or if I say something that's not clear, go ahead and raise a hand, and we can save the more subtle questions for later. But if something's unclear, go ahead and interrupt me. Okay, so animal models for neuroimaging. I don't know if I got this title from Brad or from Vesna and Doris, but it's a rather daunting title. <laughs> um, so thinking of animal models for neuroimaging writ large, I think of this three-dimensional space to explore and on one axis might be the biology and pathologies that we can think about that might be of interest. And on another axis, the species of animals that we might want to use. And then on the third axis, the methods that we can use to look at the brain in these animal models. And so ideally, um, I would give you a lovely overview of this entire three-dimensional space and give you some broad principles um, but in practice, let's just plug keywords into PubMed and explore this space a little bit. So for instance, if you're interested in development of the brain, you might want to use zebrafish and use optical methods. Those are the three positions in our three-dimensional space. And this gorgeous picture is a zebrafish larva that's been genetically engineered to be transparent so we can see into the brain, and also genetically engineered so every neuron emits light when it fires. And so this is imaged with multi-photon multi -photon microscopy. And I believe at this stage, the zebrafish larva has about 100,000 neurons, and whole brain patterns of activation can be seen going from, oh geez, Oh, geez. Okay. Going from baseline to then in a stimulated state, you can see a pattern of activation in the whole brain with, I think, about one second resolution. And then what's really nice is it's microscopy. The spatial resolution is such that from these 100,000 neurons, you can see individual neurons firing. It's just kind of amazing to me. Um, one might look, want to look at uh, blood flow in rats, and that can actually be done with ultrasound with high spatial resolution and high temporal resolution, sorry. Um, so this is looking at the patterns of activation in the brain, here's one millimeter, um, in response to different stimulations, and then here's the temporal pattern of activation with high temporal resolution. Um, in this study, they were looking at a stroke model in rat using CT, and looking at the vasculature um, using radio-opaque dye. And then as a final example, um, this is a mouse model of breast cancer metastasis, where um, uh, breast cancer cells were labeled with iron oxide particles and injected into the circulation, and some of them reached, oh, I'm so sorry, <laughs> some of them reached the brain. And you can see those cells labeled with the iron oxide particles as uh, dark spots in the MRI. And here's a blow up of this one at day zero. There's one cell so that's imaging a single cell, which is quite amazing to me. And then as time goes on, as you get out to a month, you see that this cell has proliferated and created a tumor. Okay, so that's the broad, not a view, but a broad little exploratory steps into animal models for neuroimaging. And then if we um, just review quickly 
methods that can be used for imaging the whole brain non-invasively. Um, in magnetic resonance imaging, in magnetic resonance imaging, the subject is placed in a strong permanent magnetic field, and this aligns the spins of the atomic nuclei along the main axis. And uh, the atomic nuclei have uh, spins and magnetic moments which are subject to the laws of quantum mechanics, but they can be thought of simplistically as a, a toy top spinning with a refrigerator magnet glued to it. And so the magnetic field aligns the spins, and the spins process around that magnetic field, and the precession frequency is proportional to the strength of the field. And so then with a radio frequency transmitter, the spins can be flipped into a higher excited state, and as they relax into a lower state, they emit radiation, which is received with a radio frequency receiver. And then by applying um, temporary and smaller uh, gradient fields, we can determine which regions in space are excited by that uh, radio frequency pulse. And in receiving the radio frequency pulse, we can read out information about where the signal came from and about the biological properties of the tissue at those positions in space. Okay, so that was MRI, magnetic resonance imaging. This is X-ray computerized tomography, CT. And <laughs> Sorry. And in this case, we have a radioactive, a uh, radioactive, in this case, we have an X-ray source outside of our subject. So this is the cross-section of our abstract rat, let us say. And out here, we have an X-ray source that rotates around the rat. And opposite the X-ray source are X-ray detectors. So the radiation from the source passes through the subject and reaches the detectors on the other side. And by measuring the absorption along all the possible lines of response, um, we get enough data that we can then use reconstruction algorithms to work backwards and determine the density of the material in the subject. And emission tomography, that was transmission tomography. So emission tomography uses similar principles. Um, but here the idea is that the radiation comes from inside the subject, not from outside the subject. So if we imagine one projection we have here our abstract rat cross-section, which is now filled with a radioactive tracer. And the radioactive nuclei have a concentration that's constant throughout, except higher in the circular region and lower in this um, oblong region. And the radioactive nuclei, they decay, and the radiation goes out in all directions. But we're interested in looking at the radiation that's going up in this 12 o'clock direction. And so we use metal collimators that only last, allow the um, radiation that goes up to pass through and reach the detector here. And so then the detector is reading the profile along the detector here. We're reading the profile of the radiation at this zero degree angle. And we see um, radiation coming from the radioactivity in the rat, let us say. But there's lower radiation in the profile here, corresponding to lower concentration along this path and higher concentration along this path results in more radiation being detected here along the profile. Um, and again, obtaining this profile relies on these heavy metal um, collimators determining the direction. And now if we have multiple projections, we just do the same thing at different positions around the clock. And for each of these positions of the detectors, we obtain different profiles. And now, like in X-ray CT, by working from these different profiles, we have reconstruction algorithms which go backwards and tell us what the concentration of radioactivity was in the subject to create these, to create these different profiles. And now... Um, I'm going to speak in more detail about PET as an imaging modality. And within that, I'm going to first talk about the physics, and then the instrumentation, and then the tracers. So to begin with the physics, um, PET is positron emission tomography, so it makes use of positrons, which are a form of antimatter. And the positron was discovered in 1932, 
Anderson was looking at uh, uh, cosmic rays using cloud chambers, and they saw these particles that behaved as if they had the mass of an electron, but the positive charge, so positive electron and positron. And we make use of uh, positrons not that come from outer space, that, but that po um, positron emission emitting radioisotopes that we make here on Earth. And we make use of the relationship between energy and mass. And so here on Earth, um, using, for instance, a beam of high-energy protons from an accelerator, we can convert a stable nucleus, such as in this case nitrogen-15. We bombard it with protons and do substitute a neutron with a proton and create an unstable isotope, oxygen-15, which lives for only a couple of minutes. And the oxygen decays back down to the stable state. And on the way decaying down, there's enough energy um, to create a positron. So there's enough energy in this high energy state um, to create the mass of a positron. And then additional energy to kick out the positron with some kinetic energy. And now we run this equation in reverse and go from mass to energy with annihilation. So here the positron emitting nucleus emits the positron um, which starts out with some amount of kinetic energy but slows down as it moves, in our case, through tissue. It slows down enough so that when it meets an electron, um, there's a high probability that they'll combine. And when they do, they annihilate with matter-antimatter annihilation. And now again, now we're changing mass into energy. And so the mass of that positron and electron come out in, as energy in the form of these two back-to-back -back photons. And the uh, positron and electron are nearly still, so conservation momentum means that these, these photons come off with 511 keV, and what's important is they come off back to back. They come off almost always on a straight line. And we make use of that in the imaging. So here comes the concept of annihilation coincidence detection. And if we imagine now our abstract rat in cross-section here, and it's filled with a radioactive tracer with radionuclide that uh, decay. And when they decay, they emit positrons, and the positrons annihilate. And the annihilation results in these outgoing photons on straight lines coming out back to back. <coughs> Excuse me. And now if, if we place a detec detectors outside the subject, and imagine what happens and if we ask that we only see um, signals from the detectors that arrive at the same time in coincidence. Then if we have an annihilation event here and the photon travels to this detector and this detector, we will see it, this blue event, and likewise for this blue event. And then for an annihilation event outside the subject, one detector might get hit, but the other one will not get hit and we won't see it. And this requires some electronics to make sure that the detectors are seeing events together, and we typically ask that the events occur within a few nanoseconds of each other. And already in the 1950s, it was demonstrated um, that this could be used in biological preparations to localize a source of radioactivity inside of an ex vivo brain, for instance. And so using that concept of annihilation coincidence detection, um, from that came positron emission tomography. And the notion here is one of electronic collimation. So if you remember with, um, with SPECT, we have these heavy metal collimators outside of the subject, and those collimators are used to determine the direction of the profile that we're looking at, and they absorb a lot of the radiation, which doesn't make it to the detectors. And in this case, with the electronic collimation, we ask either in electronics or software um, for coincidences between coincidences between oh my, <laughs> coincidences between detectors connected by these solid lines, and if we look at those coincidences, then we're looking at radiation coming from our rat that's um, going in the up and down direction, going in the twelve o'clock direction, 
And from this ring of detectors surrounding the subject, if we ask for coincidences between detectors connected by the dashed lines, then we get the profile of radiation coming out at, say, this 45-degree angle. And so, consequently, with a ring of detectors, we can simultaneously look at all of the uh, profiles at the same time and without any losses due to collimators. And so this provides much greater efficiency. Okay. So the actual PET scanners themselves, briefly, um, in 1973 at Washington University in St. Louis, there was the positron emission transaxial tomograph, I think they called it at the time. And that consisted of 24 detector elements um, arranged around a 25 centimeter transaxial field of view and provided about 14 millimeter full width half maximum resolution. And they were able to image a, a dog, the chest of a dog with uh, three tracers so in this case, radioactive ammonia labeled with nitrogen-13 for looking at myocardial perfusion, and radioactive water labeled with um, oxygen-15 for looking at perfusion in general, and carbon monoxide labeled with carbon-11 uh, to label the hemoglobin and look at uh, the red blood cells in the blood pool. And there have been many advances in PET in the last 40 years. Um, so, for instance, if you go in the clinic, a PET scanner typically always now has a CT scanner attached to it. Um, the resolutions have been improving in clinical scanners and so on. And for our purposes, the interesting innovation uh, was the development of the MicroPET at UCLA in 1997. And now we're up to from, uh, was it 24? Now we're up to 2,000 crystal elements and resolution of about 2 millimeters full width half maximum. And that's enough to let us see small features in small animal models, and that's interesting for us. And then the uh, resolution limits do, do a variety of factors. So the solid angle of the detectors, depth of interaction in the detectors, positron range, and non-collinearity, these all mean that in principle, the best resolution is maybe about a millimeter or less. And so with two millimeters, we're getting close to the best resolution possible. And so now let me move on and talk about tracers. So a tracer is something that should behave like a substance of interest, and yield biological information. Um, it should have no physiological effect. So we want it to measure things, but we don't want it to act like a drug and change the subject. So we should um, administer it at very low masses. And then especially for humans, we want it to be safe and there should be low radioactivity, and at minimum in animal studies, we'd like it to have no biological effect over the course of the study. And so here's a, a, a list of, of some tracers that we've used at Wisconsin in the MicroPET, just to give you some examples. So you can look at blood flow with water labeled with oxygen-15, or um, a, a fluoromethane with an inert diffusible tracer labeled with fluorine-17. Look at blood volume, again with carbon monoxide labeled with carbon-11. Oxygen extraction labeled with oxygen-15. <clears throat> glucose metabolism with fluorodeoxyglucose labeled with fluorine-18. Uh, and then, for instance, we do a lot of dopamine work. Um, they're tracers for looking at dopamine synthesis for transporters at the cellular wall and at the vesicles. And for D1 and D2 type receptors, we use a variety of tracers. And likewise for serotonin, there are tracers for the transporter and the receptors. And um, this is just a small subset of all of the tracers that are available in the world. There's things for all kinds of studies. So when we think about imaging the whole brain non-invasively, we need to get that tracer to the brain. So it's first administered typically intravenously. The tracer moves through the circulation and gets to the brain and into the cerebral vasculature and finally into the capillaries where it transfers into the tissue. And a good tracer will make it across the blood-brain barrier into the tissue, which is a challenge for the chemists. And also, when that tracer is metabolized, for instance, in the liver, 
for a good tracer, those metabolites will not go across the blood-brain barrier into the brain. Um, and then another aspect of the tracer is what you do with that information. You can have um, just images, which qualitatively can tell you a lot. Um, but we're interested also in getting quantitative information about biological processes. And for that, we use compartmental modeling of the tracers. So in a one-tissue compartment model, um, there's one compartment, say, the plasma. And this provides an input function for the tracer. So there's some concentration of the tracer in plasma. And then there's a forward uh, rate constant for transport from the plasma compartment into the tissue compartment. And a rate constant for flow out from the tissue compartment back into plasma. And so given the input function, so given the concentration of the tracer as a function of time in the plasma, the input function, and given these two transport coefficients, we can then calculate what the tissue response would be. So this is a one tissue compartment model, which would be appropriate, for instance, for an inert diffusible blood flow tracer like water. And we can write down the differential equation that describes what's happening which is just saying that the change of concentration of the tracer in tissue is because of flux into the tissue from the plasma minus flux out of the tissue back into the plasma. And then the models can get more complicated, so we can have, I can't really see from here, yes, two tissue compartments. Um, and for instance, uh, here, a tracer that is trapped in tissue or that can go into a reversibly bound state and back into plasma. And let's see, let me just say, so what's interesting again are these Ks. These tell us about the biology. And to get them, we need the tissue information, which we get from the PET scanner. But also, in these models, we need to know what's happening in the blood. So we can sample arterial blood and see what the input function is. But often what we do is uh, a simpler method, which is to use a reference tissue. So if we're lucky that there's a region in the brain where the tracer does not specifically bind, then we can use that region as a reference tissue. And the way that works is you start with the two tissue compartment model, where we have an input function from the um, plasma flowing in and out of tissue, and then once it's in tissue, there's a prob possibility for it to bind, for instance, to a receptor or to dissociate from the receptor. And there's equations that describe those fluxes. And then if we have a region, um, for instance, if we're doing dopamine imaging, looking at dopamine receptor binding, the um, cerebellum is relatively devoid of dopamine receptors then we can use this reference region with its own rate constants for inflow and outflow. And essentially use that information to infer the input function, um, do some algebra, make some assumptions, and end up with equations describing the system. And what's important is that no place in here is there the um, concentration in plasma. And then if the uh, binding and dissociation, so this K3 and K4 over here, if these processes are fast enough, then the whole, uh, whole tissue compartment can be um, simplified and thought of as a single compartment, and that yields even singler, simpler analysis pathways. And what's important is, in the end, what we're typically after is this binding potential which tells us um, it's a combination of the affinity of the tracer for the target. So for instance, the affinity of, say, raclopride for dopamine D2 receptors and the concentration of the target receptors in uh, nanomoles per mil in the tissue. And then a final piece of methodology, um, we obtain these images and we typically want to compare animals um, between animals and within animals. And so one way to go, and the way that I usually work, is to take the images and put them into a template space. 
And so in that case, when all of the images are aligned into this template space, we can then interrogate it by regions of interest and ask, for instance, what is the tracer doing in this region of cortex or in this part of stridum? Okay. So I'm going to go for about 15 more minutes, um, and then we'll have time for a little bit of questions, then we can move on to Vikas and talk about the medical applications. Um, so I'm going to provide some examples now. And I have to apologize uh, that these examples are all from Madison, uh, not because I think we do the best possible science in Madison and everything else is crap, but because I'm lazy and this is the stuff that I can talk about with a little bit of fluency. So again, I apologize that this is not really a review of the, the world literature on pet imaging. So this is the lovely campus at the uh, University of Wisconsin-Madison, um, cluttered up with a lot of lovely pet equipment. So we have a linear accelerator and two cyclotrons that are two cyclotrons, one here, sorry, and one here, that are dedicated to making pet radioisotopes. And then we have state-of-the-art clinical scanners and some older scanners and some that have gone away. Um, but what's interesting today is we have three small animal scanners, this one, this one, and this one. So we have uh, a Siemens Focus 220 we acquired recently, which has a 26 centimeter bore, so it's a good size. It's large enough for monkey brains, monkey head. And we also, um, we also can use it to study rats. We put four rats in it at a time. And then that came in place of the old P4, which has been around since 2003, but is still humming along. Um, the new scanner, the 220, has about three microliter volumetric resolution compared to five microliters for the older scanner. And then we also have a Siemens Invion, which is appropriate for rodents with a 10 centimeter bore and also provides the three microliter resolution. Okay, so here are some examples. We'll range across the tree of life and look at some examples of, of pet imaging. And for this first one, I apologize. This is not brain imaging, but I just couldn't resist letting you know that in these commercial scanners, we're studying plants. So this is looking at uh, radioactive fluoride and looking at ion transport in a plant, a relative of broccoli. Okay, here we go with the animal models. <clears throat> So this is work in Parrot. We were looking at glucose metabolism, and the interest was in anesthesia. And actually, this was not for humans. This was for the sake of the birds, because very little is known about anesthesia in birds. So if you have this beloved 50-year-old parrot that goes in for surgery, they don't really know what they're doing when they give mammalian anesthetics. Um, and so here we were looking at um, here we were looking at a model of arthritis, so it's resolving um, experimental arthritis where they inject uric acid crystals into what would be the parrot's ankle. Um, and so this causes the parrot some pain, which resolves after a couple of days, but when it's got this temporary arthritis, it favors that leg. And so we injected the parrots with FDG, which traces glucose metabolism. Um, both in the pain condition and in the control condition, and did this for four parrots. So each row corresponds to one of the four subjects with the mean images at the bottom. And in these first panels, we see in the control condition these two coronal views um, with no pain. And here in the arthritis condition, we see the same regions of the brain. And then the difference images where it's red that tells us that there's more glucose metabolism and presumably more neural activity in the pain condition. And then looking at the average difference image over the four subjects, we see that there's increased activity, or activity in this um, posterior part of the brain. Presumably that's primary sensory input and increased activity in this frontal region of the brain, which is um, presumably more of the advanced pain processing and corresponds to the location of uh, kappa opioid receptors that we saw in a separate measurement. Okay, and so then this is uh, in the rat, looking at uh, labeled hemoglobin to look at blood volume. 
And so, as I said, we have a couple of cyclotrons at Madison, but we also have this uh, lower energy, cheaper uh, tandem uh, linear accelerator that's positioned in a psychology lab for creating short-lived blood flow tracers. And we actually use this um, for doing some carbon-11 developmental chemistry. And so, in the target here, we made uh, radioactive carbon-11 labeled carbon monoxide, and then um, administered to it it to a rat by inhalation and got these lovely pictures of the blood volume. And there's actually no experimental question here. Um, we, weren't, we weren't doing really any science with it, but just looking at uh, where the labeled hemoglobin went. Okay. Now, here is a rat model where we were interested in using a uh, cheap and safe um, antibiotic called minocycline as a potential therapy for multiple sclerosis. And so in this case, we had a couple dozen rats, um, which uh, we created lesions in the corpus callosum um, which, where there was an immune, an immune response generated. And we used a tracer called PK11195, which is labeled with carbon-11 and binds to activated microglia, which are the resident macrophages in the brain. And so in this first panel A, we see uh, the, the, the um, template image. In panel B, we see blood flow images from early delivery of the tracer, which we use to align to the template image. And then in panel C, this is one subject showing a lesion in the right corpus callosum where there's um, additional radioactivity because of the binding of the PK11195. And then here in panel D, um, this is the average of all of the um, lesion regions of interest, just showing that there was pretty good reproducibility and positioning of the lesions and, 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 lo and localizing them in the images. And then we looked at this lesion, this green, green lesion ROI, and then also at these control regions of interest. And what we saw was that the PK binding indeed increased significantly and by a lot. That's this black bar in the lesion. And in rats that were given um, systemic monocycline, that microglial activity was knocked down by about 40 or 50 percent. So this is interesting. I mean, this had been seen without PET, um, but it was interesting. This gave us additional precision. And also, um, I think a big theme in animal modeling is this is a tracer that is used in humans, so it raises the possibility of Using, uh, using it in a, a therapeutic study like this in humans. Here in a marmoset model, so a marmoset is a non-human primate about rat size, they're four or 500 grams, and they have brains that are about 25 millimeters on a side, so they have much larger, more human-like brains. Um, and they're interesting because in this study because they, they um, mate for, they, they pair bond. And in this study, we're interested in female reproductive behavior and looking at glucose metabolism in the brain. And so here we have the MRI template. In the second row is the MRI from one subject. In the third row is the FDG template. And in the fourth row and fifth row, this is the same subject in uh, two conditions. So she's here. Um, we injected the females with FDG <clears throat> and traced the glucose metabolism while they were awake for half an hour um, with their male pair mate. And we looked at them in a control condition, <clears throat> excuse me, <coughs> and after several weeks of chronic treatment with a serotonin 1A agonist. So this was um, trying to look at the connections between the serotonin system and reproductive behavior. And we saw um, across eight subjects between the two conditions, we saw decreased metabolic activity in this occipital cortex um, indicated by red, decreased activity due to the serotonin 1A agonist, and the decreases in activity correlated with decreases in sexual behavior, um, which were seen in this blue region, and then the overlap is shown in the yellow. So it's telling us that something interesting is happening um, back here in this, in this um, occipital cortical region. And then this is a nice study using rhesus as a model. 
um, and the tracer is labeled tyrosine, which is a substrate for an enzyme. Um, oh, help me, Doris. AAD, triple ADC, aromatic amino acid decarboxylase, um, which is important in creating uh, dopamine in the synthesis, synthesis pathway for dopamine. And uh, the question is, the question is, uh, how quickly is this enzyme being generated over time? Um, and that's of interest because a typical uh, treatment in Parkinson's disease is to give levodopa as, as treatment, which is a substrate for this enzyme. So here we see the enzyme activity indicated by trapping of the tracer, the labeled tyrosine, at baseline, at, at zero, time zero. And then the enzyme was wiped out by giving a drug. And immediately after, we imaged and saw no activity of the enzyme. And the activity of the enzyme slowly returns after several days. And so this is, a, I think, a beautiful longitudinal study in a single animal. We actually did this in two animals. And the enzyme activity as a function of time seems to be recovering exponentially with a half time of about 200 hours. What is that, eight days? Okay. This is another study using rhesus as a model Again, looking at glucose metabolism using FDG as the tracer. And here the model is for childhood anxiety. Um, and this was done in a couple of hundred rhesus monkeys. We did a couple hundred PET scans and associated their anxiety as measured by cortisol levels and cooing for help and freezing in response to a potential threat. And here the threat was a, a researcher would come into the room and just stare at the wall for half an hour. So it's the so-called no eye contact condition. And some monkeys, especially the more anxious ones, would freak out. And they'd freak out in different ways. So some would uh, make threat displays to the human, and some would just freeze. And so the, the freezing ones were considered maybe a model for childhood, some forms of childhood anxiety. And this is of interest. Um, and what we saw was regions in amygdala where the glucose metabolism, pre presumably the neural activity in the amygdala, correlated um, with this measures of anxious temperament, and that these regions of neural activity that correlate with anxious temperament overlapped with regions that were seen to have high binding of um, a serotonin transporter tracer in a separate study on a smaller subset. Okay, and this is a study of, that Brad's done with a new tracer for um, uh, nicotinic acetylcholine uh, receptors, and there was no experimental manipulation here, but it's uh, of potential interest in addiction, and as expected, you see a lot of accumulation of the tracer in thalamus. And in this case, we're looking at rhesus, looking at uh, serotonin 1A receptors. And we saw that the serotonin 1A receptor density depended, or, uh, depended on the uh, serotonin transporter allele. And then this is work, again, in rhesus. And now looking at blood flow, and this may have some implications for drug abuse, looking at the acute response to amphetamine. Um, which had not been studied in rhesus before, although it's well studied in humans and in baboons and in rats. Um, so here's a typical um, image of the radioactive tracer, uh, the blood flow tracer across the brain in these different regions. And in five animals, we uh, uh, took baseline images and then gave a moderate dose of amphetamine. And the red regions show increased blood flow in the regions that you would expect, so frontostriatal regions, and decreases in blood flow in parietal and temporal regions, and increases in blood flow in the cerebellum. And then in the same monkeys, <clears throat> we looked at the response of binding of a dopamine, recept a dopamine uh, receptor ligand, and that response of binding gives some indication of release of endogenous dopamine. So here are the same five animals. Um, and these are the time activity curves where we see amphetamine administered at one hour and decreases in binding of a dopamine receptor ligand. And in three of the animals, 
um, sham injections which produced negligible changes in the binding. And so by the how much these um, curves dive, that tells us an indication of, we interpret that as release of endogenous dopamine. And so combining this information with the blood flow information, we perhaps can say something about how um, neural activity in the brain is com controlled by dopaminergic modulation. And finally, uh, in a, again, in a rhesus model, and this is, a, to my mind, a very interesting rhesus model. Um, so these are animals that are now middle-aged, and when they were in utero, their moms were exposed to either um, mild prenatal stress or moderate levels of alcohol, so the equivalent of a couple of drinks a day for alcohol. And the question, of course, is, you know, is, is moderate alcohol um, bad in pregnancy? We assume it is, but it's very hard to tell just from human studies. So here's an example where the experimental control offered by animal studies can really let us ask these questions um, carefully. But in this case, we're talking about the prenatal stress and using a dopamine transporter ligand that's a, a cocaine analog. And it lights up the dopamine transporters, which are seen in, in striatum and in midbrain. And what we saw in this two by two design, so again, there were four groups, controls, animals whose mothers were drinking alcohol during pregnancy, animals whose mothers were exposed to prenatal stress during pregnancy, and animals whose mothers were exposed to the combination during pregnancy. And so in the offspring, we're seeing a 15% increase in uh, binding uh, to the dopamine transporters uh, as a main effect of stress. <clears throat> and then finally, across all animals, that uh, dopamine transporter binding is correlating with measure of behavior um, response to, to tactile stimulation, so sort of how jumpy they are, and this may indicate, have something to do with sensory defensiveness or sensory gating, um, which is seen in fetal alcohol syndrome and may be related, for instance, to later ADHD. Okay, so let me um, real quickly give you some conclusions, um, and they're basically just platitudes, so I think um, Animal models are good because, again, they do allow the experimental control and the manipulations that are not possible in human studies. <clears throat> and then thinking about the other axes, um, non-invasive imaging of the brain is good uh, because it lets us do, for instance, longitudinal studies where the animal acts as its own control. And also those methods, so for instance, MRI and PET, to the extent they work in animals, they can be transferred to humans. Um, and uh, just a, a, a prejudice, I think that when we do animal imaging, it's good if there's some other uh, variable that's being looked at, for instance, the behavior. So that's it. Thank you.